just to briefly put this in context, the, uh, the book is, it takes RuPaul's Drag Race, you don't have to know all the aspects of the show, but it takes the framework of the show, knowing that it is very popular among uh, young, young, say, Gen Z people. If you ever go to DragCon, there's all these like 16 to 21 year olds who are huge fans of the show. And we wanted to contextualize all the references in the show and use them as a jumping off point to uh, teach the children about uh, queer culture and where all these traditions come from. So if you do watch the show, once a season, they do the library challenge, which is where the queens are asked to read one another. Now, reading and shade is a very long tradition in the drag world. And I'm going to launch right into sort of an explanation about it. I wanted to contextualize this first in case you thought I was going to do some top 10 most sickening looks on drag race thing. That's kind of not what this is. So, <clears throat> the long history of learning to read for filth was born out of the idea that a cutting wit and a sense of self is all a queen has to protect herself in the world. A drag queen of yore would have had to deal with not only the prospect of being bashed, but also the prospect of being harassed by the police. Learning to cut a man down by verbally pushing all his buttons often meant the difference between life and death, a trip to the emergency room, or a trip in a paddy wagon. In a harsh world, the ability to read someone's beads was a necessary survival tactic, and still is for many queens and queers. Bottom line, for most working drag queens, for the entire length of time there have been working drag queens, as well as transgender women existing and living as women, life has been harder than it would be otherwise. And if a queen doesn't learn how to fight back against her oppressors, whether those oppressors are straight cops or narrow-minded or bigoted gays, then a queen is going to find it hard to survive. But shade and reading can be indicators or harbingers of so much more. Shade can lead to art. Reading can lead to revolution. In 1967, at the Miss All-American Camp Beauty Pageant held in New York, the reigning Miss Manhattan, a big-haired, coal-eyed glamour queen named Crystal LeBeja, walked off stage mid-ceremony upon learning her status as a third runner-up. She wanted no part of what was about to go down, although, as it turned out, she had plenty of thoughts she was willing to express on the matter. Highly unusual for the time, cameras were there to record her reaction. In fact, there's a pretty decent argument to be made that those very cameras amplified her reaction, much in the manner of a reality TV show a half century later. But this was no television show. The very idea of featuring drag queens on television in the 1960s, let alone black drag queens like Miss Crystal, was completely unheard of. This was something almost as shocking, a documentary about drag queens. The brainchild of a drag pageant impresario named Jack Dorishow, who emceed the pageant and narrated the film in his drag persona, Mother Flawless Sabrina, The Queen, was released in 1968 and eventually played at the Cannes Film Festival. Its initial fame was rather short-lived, although it became a cult classic and eventually, thanks first to video stores and later to streaming services, became something of an ancient text of drag a glimpse into the murky, shaky, pre-Stonewall past when drag was literally illegal. Competing in drag pageants and balls of the 1960s, when queens of color like herself were expected to whiten their appearance, Crystal LeBeja persevered with a fierce fabulosity and every reigning drag queen's best weapon, a sharp tongue. In The Queen, she established herself as the patron saint of shade, reciting the Ur text of reading as she, shall we say, offered her thoughts, I will sue the bitch on the quality and ethics of the pageant in which she had just placed as third runner up. Rachel Harlow, a pretty realness serving white queen from Philadelphia, was crowned the winner of the pageant, much to Miss Crystal's consternation. Clearly, to have someone happy to have someone filming her, Crystal reads poor, Bar poor Harlow's beads. Get a picture with me and Harlow and we'll see which is more beautiful, darling. And leaves her speechless before turning her ire on mother flawless Sabrina, accusing her of favoritism and exploitation. When Sabrina tries to counter that Crystal's invective shows her true color, Miss Thang doesn't waste herself a nanosecond, shooting back with her voice rising on each syllable, I have a right to show my color, darling. I am beautiful and I know I'm beautiful. I am beautiful and I know I'm beautiful. That's pretty much the drag credo right there. It should always be followed by a trumpet blare. 
That's what makes Crystal's read so fabulous to behold. It's pure in its rage, and also in its expression and turns of phrases. Every syllable reaffirms her supremacy, the tragedy of her lessers, and the injustice that these things are not being recognized to her satisfaction. This is a queen, darling. In 1977, Crystal was asked by her friend and fellow drag queen Lottie to help her launch a drag ball. Crystal, having spent her entire drag career fighting for recognition in venues that didn't value queens of color, including the balls, agreed and took the idea one revolutionary step further by founding the legendary house of Labasia, one of the first drag houses with a titular mother in Crystal herself. Lottie and Crystal launched their first drag ball at a Harlem bar called Up the Downstairs Case with a flyer that was simple but seismic in its own way. Crystal and Lottie LaBeja presents the first annual House of LaBeja Ball at Up the Downstairs Case. A manifesto it was not, and yet it signaled what would become a stunning change in queer history and culture, and more important, a life-changing development for generations of queer people of color. Drag houses sprung up immediately after, all legendary from the start and legendary to this day. The House of Extravaganza, the House of Saint Laurent, the House of Dupree, the House of Ninja. Queer and transgender people of color took back a portion of LGBTQ culture, recentered their own perspectives, aesthetics, and artistic voices, and gave untold numbers of people an outlet and form of expression that developed from within their communities. In this way, Crystal responded to the racism she encountered in the drag pageant community with not just an epic read, but with a revolutionary action that had far-reaching consequences for queer culture, echoing down the decades to today. It's perhaps a bit too easy to draw a straight line from her one media appearance in The Queen to her one major contribution to queer culture. Life rarely works out that neatly or cinematically. But when you take the long view, it's not hard to see how her epic read dressing down an undeserving white winner and her legendary introduction of drag mother houses to the ball community are connected, all part of the same larger picture of her life. Like so many important LGBTQ figures of the past, she lived her life and made her contributions in the underground, away from the historians and journalists who could have and should have immortalized her. And like so many trailblazers, she changed the world not because she felt like it, but because she had to, in order to survive in the way that she wanted. Respect. She demanded it, she knew it was owed her, and if the world wasn't going to give it to her on their terms, she damn well changed the terms to suit her better. This is why a read or skillful application of shade can be about so much more than simply getting one over on someone or putting them down. Reading comes from deep inside a queen's need to be understood, respected, and in many cases, cases worshipped for her beauty and grace. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you write that drag queens are the perfect avatars for the broad spectrum of queer life. Uh, so on the one hand, we have Crystal, whom you just read about. I am beautiful, and I know I am beautiful. Exactly. And then on the other end, you might have the famous drag queen Divine, uh, about whom Trixie said, she made me feel like it was okay to be as unbeautiful as I wanted to be. Uh, so my question is, what do Crystal and Divine and all the performers and artists in the book you write about have in common? What makes them all legendary? I think what makes them special is because they're, first of all, they're all different. Uh, and that alone, I think it's, it, it's a, big message, it's, it's a major message that you can, you don't all have to be the same. All the queens don't have to be the same. They can come from different backgrounds, they can have different stories, and they all do, uh, different ethnic groups and, and, you know, different skin color or anything. And they all contribute, they all added something to the queer community. Uh, we should mention that the book is not just about drag queens. The book encompasses the broad spectrum of queer culture and queer life and how it's all filtered through drag race. So. I mean, believe it or not, we were able to jump off from a discussion about the pit crew at one point to a discussion of lesbian erotica in the 1950s. Uh, that's, what, that's what I mean about taking these things and just being as expansive as possible. So when the people who are legendary in this book, they were, were legendary in our opinion because they formed 
what we call modern queer culture. Crystal Abeja formed the drag, the ball right. community, basically, as we know it now. Prior to that, it was a largely white event. And if you see, like, Pose, or if you've ever watched Paris is Burning, her work is clear that she recentered that art for people, uh, you know, queer people of color. They're all artists, or there are political figures in the book. There are, um, you know, just people who live their lives and happen to make a, a change. But all of these people contributed to what we consider queer culture now, to all of our traditions and beliefs, to our slang terms and that sort of thing. So that's why they're in the book. That's largely the, the main reason. You write in the introduction to the book that it's meant to be read one-handed. Yes. Which is a perfect uh, thing to bring up for this crowd <laughs> at Google. Well, first of all, I think we should thank all of well, you. Well, let's let her finish <laughs> the question. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I know exactly what you're getting at because absolutely, I read the book like this with my phone in the other hand, constantly Google image search, yes. YouTube, looking up clips and images um, to learn more about the people you write about in the book. And feel free to uh, talk more about your intro and, and why you wrote that. But my, <laughs> my, my question is, um, was there any uh, area or person that you wished you could um, have delved deeper into or spent more time writing about? Oh my goodness, half of them. Half mm -hmm. of them I wish I could have just pitched a biography of just that person. Like I would love to write a biography of Crystal LeBeza or something like that. Um, but uh, who would I want it to have written more about in the book? Um, Crystal is one. There's a, a, a drag king in the 1920s called Gladys Bentley. She's on the cover. Um, and uh, I've been doing a reading about her uh, from the book in, in our appearances up till now. But her story is very poignant. And I usually wind up crying by the time I get to the end of it, like publicly crying. And I was like, I'm not doing that at Google. That's why I chose Crystal Lubasia. But Gladys had an amazing life. She was an amazing, unbelievable. Like, in 1922, she's walking out in the world dressed as a man in top hat and tails and singing filthy, filthy songs about lesbian sex. Uh, and she was one of the highest paid black entertainers in, in the world in the 1920s until she got slapped back and her life right. it took a somewhat tragic turn. But um, I, I, I mean, people ask us who our favorite people are on the book and we always say if they're on the front or the back cover because we those hand chose all of those people those are the ones right hibiscus of san francisco right i'd give anything to write a book about that guy you might not know it but there's a super super famous picture from the 1960s google it a google it <laughs> of uh, a, a hippie protest of the vietnam war and there's this cute young blonde guy sticking carnations down the barrels of each gun. It's one of the most famous pictures of the 1960s. That guy, who was unidentified at the time, went on, off to San Francisco in 1967 to find himself, um, grew his hair long and put glitter in his beard and became a drag queen known as Hibiscus and formed a theater group called the Coquettes. And he helped discover Sylvester, the disco singer. He helped discover Divine. He worked with Marsha P. Johnson. He was one of these seminal figures whose lives just crossed with all these other seminal figures. Right. And um, like so many of the people in the book, he died of AIDS in, in the, like, the early 1980s. And uh, he had a fascinating life story, absolutely fascinating. So trying to collect information for all these people was very hard because first, there's not a lot of stuff out there. No. Uh, and we were, and we, first of all, it was hard to narrow these, j just to these, just to talk about these people because at first we started looking at international drag queens and international people. Uh, but it just became we had to broad. narrow the focus. So we had to narrow it down to just American uh, uh, queens in general. Um, and we also made the decision that we had to, you're going to laugh, but it's true. Uh, we wanted to make sure that people could Google <laughs> the people that we mentioned. It was in the built book. into the book. Yes. We, we want, want to make sure that people could read that information. When we talk about a video, when we talk about a recording or whatever, and people would read. And that's why we say, you know, it's, it's supposed to, our book's supposed to be read with one hand, and the other hand, you're Googling it. You're trying to find out uh, who that person is. And that was by design for two reasons. One is which we had a really short deadline for this book. The entire thing had to be researched and written in four months. And the reason for that is because it's in the title, the proposed title, the first decade of RuPaul's Drag Race. And so there you're immediately imposing, like, we got to get this book out. We can't be releasing it. In, because the 10-year 10, 10 anniversary was actually last year. Uh, so we had a short deadline. And then when we realized that we were, uh, who we had in mind for writing the book were those young fans 
we realized, well, that's how they live their lives. They live their lives connected to their phones, connected to, and they, anything they get curious about, they're going to go to their phone and look it up. So the book was literally written with that idea. Let me describe to you Crystal LeBeige's read, and then you can go and actually see her do the whole thing. You can find it in three seconds. Thanks to Google, um, <laughs> and that's pretty much true of everybody in the book. And we restricted our choice of people to people that you could find very easily, to these legendary central figures of whom there's an archive of work already existent online. That makes sense. And was there anything that surprised you as you were researching for the book? Uh, yes. Well, I wouldn't say it surprised me, but it reaffirmed something that I you sort of had a sense, we both had a sense of. I would say 70% of this book, because we are gay men of a certain age who always had an interest in this sort of thing anyway, we probably own about 150 books on gay history and culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of them we refer to, we use to start as our reference points. I would say about 70% of the book we were pretty familiar with. The people and the events we knew fairly well. But in a general sense, when you look at pre-Stonewall queer life, um, the, as I word it, the L, the G, the B, the T, and the Q. We were all huddled under one umbrella at that time um, because uh, we had no choice. We were so marginalized. Uh, and the outside world, the mainstream world, didn't see it, it, like in 1960 or so, didn't see a difference between a drag queen and a butch lesbian, a trans woman and a gay man. We were all queers and freaks and perverts, and we were marginalized and at, and at the very margins of society. And because of that, we huddled. And if you look at the history of, say, the Stonewall Riots, who was at the Stonewall Riots? Gay men, transgender women, uh, lesbians, and drag queens. Uh, if you go three years earlier to the Compton Cafeteria Riots in 1966, less famous, but they are a seminal point in queer history, who took part in those riots? Gay men, lesbians, drag queens, transgender women. Why? Because we were all together all, all the time. There existed lesbian bars. The lesbian bars of the 1950s in New York were so sophisticated, I'd write a whole book about them. And of course, there have been gay male bars forever. But generally speaking, we huddled. And what happened is Stonewall c came along. A white cisgender um, leadership uh, rose up in our community as we coalesced as a political force, and um, lesbians were sidelined, transgender women were sidelined, and we started splitting up. And this was necessary. Not that, not that I wouldn't, and the book does criticize the uh, movement for marginalizing those people all along, but it was necessary for us to break apart in a lot of ways. In the 70s and in the 80s, a lot of lesbian social and political groups broke off from gay groups because they felt they had more kinship with feminist groups at the time than they did with hanging out with a bunch of white gay men. They felt they weren't being listened to. Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, legendary mothers of the movement, transgender women, uh, they went off and started uh, star the Street Transvestite Actions Revolutionary Group, STAR. And um, it was all about taking care of themselves. And we have been segmented for most of the 50 years sense. And as a community, just that acronym, LGBTQ, is starting to slowly right. bring us back together under that umbrella. There's resistance to it. Um, again, my white cisgender gay brothers are probably the most resistant to this coming together. Um, but it is happening. And part of the reason uh, the book is pitched towards younger people is because those are the people that are going to make it happen. It won't be our generation, unfortunately, my generation, unfortunately, because my generation tends to be fighting this coming together. But when you look at queer kids, say under the age of 20, uh, what I love about them as a generation is that their queerness is unspecific. There are so many kids out there who call themselves queer and will not declare any other thing about their identity. And that's great. You're at 16. Why should you? Um, and using that acronym, having that acronym, is allowing those kids that freedom right. of choice and expression. They don't have to make that decision right and away, or they can switch to something else if they feel like it later on. And in the researching and writing of that book, that sort of through line came up, and I was like, that's it. That's the whole 50 year, last 50 years of our community. We were together, we split apart, and it has slowly been, but we're not there yet.
Yeah, I, I actually I have a question along those lines. So uh, you highlighted um, a number of transgender women in the book, uh, including um, Jackie Shane, the yeah. singer, and uh, Tracy Norman, the model. Mm -hmm. um, some others who I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting, uh, but there's been some tension between the trans community and the drag community. Very much so. Um, you know, some of which RuPaul has has been a part of with insensitive comments. Um, but my impression from the book is that overall those communities overlapped quite a lot and quite were lot. allies. Um, so w you would agree with that? Yeah, I would agree Absolutely. with that. Uh, a couple people early in, in, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. A couple people early in the reviews were kind of of the book were kind of wondering why we were conflating drag queens and transgender women. Because in pre-Stonewall era, that there was so much overlap. So many drag queens back then were trans women who couldn't express, who couldn't live their transness, who mm. couldn't live their lives as women. And um, so they did it as drag queens. And um, a lot of trans women back then entered the world of drag to learn how to, how to present themselves as a woman, uh, you know? So there was a lot of overlap back then. There's a really interesting story in the writing of the book that we couldn't include because it got a little too inside baseball. But real short, there was a drag review that traveled the country from the 30s to the 60s called the Jewel Box Review. And we wrote about it. And there's a, uh, a line in it. The point of writing about it was that uh, the Jewel Box Review traveled the country uh, doing drag for straight audiences. And constantly in the marketing of it, it was, oh, we're wholesome family entertainment. There are no perverts in this. but the whole backstage was nothing but queens and, and transgender women putting this show together. And I, we wrote it that way. The backstage was full of queens and transgender women. We sent that chapter to this 75-year-old queer historian whose opinion we respected, who knows a lot about this culture. And we said, could you read this chapter and make sure we got it right? He came back a couple days later. He said, you got everything's great, but I did pass it all on to, and he named this queen from the drag review, who was in it from about the 50s to about the, to, to the end of it, which was 1969. Um, and this, this queen is, she'd probably be in her 80s by now. She's living life as a trans woman. She transitioned long after she left the show. And she took issue with that line. She said, no, there were no transgender women backstage. We, it, they would not have allowed it. They would have fired us. And this is a trans woman saying this who actually worked there. And this has come up a lot. Our elders did not talk about themselves right. the way we talk about them now. So in our modern understanding of being trans, you're trans no matter what. You're trans whether you look it, whether you transition, whether you declare it. It's endemic to your personality. But to this 80-year-old trans woman, she had a different view of it. She wasn't trans until she transitioned. Uh, that's not the modern view of trans. So I, I was like, what do we, we batted around, well, what do we do with this line? Because I don't want to take that out. There were trans women backstage. They just weren't openly trans at the time. So we had to just change the wording to queer people backstage and leave it open. That's one of those things that you come up against in writing about people from other generations, how they saw themselves right. versus how, how, how queer you know, politics would refer right. to them now. Does that answer your question? Because yeah. I kind of rambled. <laughs> no, I, no. We told her before, and it was like, just point us in the direction, and we'll go on for an hour. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that's great. Okay. Um, <laughs> I want to get back to, uh, you mentioned uh, tearing up when you uh, did the reading about uh, Gladys. Gladys Bentley. Uh, oh. Yeah, and, um, and I actually found myself tearing up um, a few times in the book. Uh, from the beginning, um, when you write about uh, Marsha P. Johnson, right. You know, just furiously yelling, "I want my civil rights I want my civil at, at Stonewall!" Rights. Throwing her yeah. shot glass at the mirror. At yeah, Stonewall. just yeah. amazing. Um, and then, of course, I, I cried a lot uh, near the end in, in your chapter about uh, queer families and the AIDS crisis. So, yes. oh yeah, did, uh, writing that chapter. Oh my God, it was was tough. We, that was my question. We had was was it difficult <laughs> to write? Weeks yeah, writing that chapter because we were crying all day. I'm gonna get choked up. We're old enough to remember the 80s. We were very young. We weren't in the community at the time. And we were not people who, um, like you hear men uh, who lost hundreds of friends or whatever like that. That was not our experience because we were very young. At the, not, not that young, but very young, very young like this time. <laughs> um, but even so, when you, get in, when you dive into those stories, um, it's not just the sadness, the overwhelming sadness and tragedy of those stories. It's the beauty of how that community, our community, came together under it, and not just ours. The point of that chapter, the queer families chapter, 
is about allyship. And in that chapter, we highlight not just queer people, but straight people who came along and nursed gay men to their deaths, took them to their doctor's appointments, brought them their meals. Right. Um, and queer. that is, you can't tell the history of queer life without talking about our allies. Um, and we wanted to do that. You know, just give a second to, to, to highlight these people, Some, right. most, almost all of whom were women, unsurprisingly. Right. Uh, it, it's us again getting to get, getting gathering and helping each other and and a lot of people don't know that but a lot of lesbians helped at the time uh there were the the and that was very poignant I right right again because there was this splitting off in the 70s um and then the aids crisis happened and no one was helping those dying men and um there were lesbian groups there was a group called the blood sisters of san diego choke up who uh bonded together to donate blood because um to the men who were dying, who sometimes needed blood transfusions for various treatments, because they, gay men could not donate blood, still can't legally donate blood. Um, and there was a lot of um, discussion and anger amongst that group of lesbians, because they were like, why are we doing this? These guys wouldn't do it for us. And you know what? They were probably right in that. But they did it anyway. And that, to me, is the heroism and the beauty of our community, the best, best part of our community coming together, even in our disagreements, even if we have problems with each other. Uh, and we wanted to highlight those stories in this time of the various internecine fighting amongst the, very, the L, the G, and the B, the T, and the Q that's going on, not fighting, but struggle to get to be heard and to be understood among these various groups. And we just wanted to say, you know what, there's a history of this, but we overcame it several times in our history, and we will overcome it again. Right. It, it's like a big family, you know, brothers yes. and sisters It sounds fighting, trite, but it's true. But it is true. Like Silver Rivera, for example, fighting, you know, for her for her sisters uh, and you know the white queer folks weren't doing anything about that and she went on stage up on stage there there's a very famous video uh, if you google it 1973 yeah, Christopher goes up Street on stage, Parade yes and then she pretty much screams at all of us and says you know you're not listening you're not doing anything for the people uh, for the transgender community, for the trans, for everybody. Uh, you know, you're just worried about yourself. And they booed her off the stage and yeah. she went home and tried to kill herself. Marsha P. Johnson found her and uh, saved her life. And uh, next year, Marsha and Sylvia are both going to be the first trans women in the United States to get statues erected to mm -hmm. them in their honor. So. Yeah. I get all choked up talking about this. Yes, I'm sorry. so sorry you, you, you said no, no, you no. didn't want to cry while I was no. I know, I said sorry. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to read something upbeat so I don't cry. But I mean, I talk about this Just talking about it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, along those lines, like, you have made me cry with a single tweet. Uh, in, the, in the first Women's March, um, you tweeted, we march for women because, because when it mattered most, they ma march for us. Yeah, and I just, I'll, I'll always it's remember true. that. It's true. I think we should, we, we should always remember that, you know. That we can't win anything alone. No, yeah, we all have to be allies to each other. Yeah, and now I, I feel I should clarify, like, you know, although I did tear up at parts of the book, it's overall like a really, you know, joyful and celebratory book. Um, yes, thank you. I think you, you wrote that people live lives filled... Um, with a ragingly defiant beauty. Yes, ragingly we defiant beauty. That, yes. Even though a lot, some of the stories in this book end, sadly, um, we refuse to see any of these people as tragic figures. Right. Um, their lives were filled with art and beauty and boldness and bravery. and whether or not they um, uh, triumphed or whether they fell, it doesn't matter. The fact that they lived their lives so boldly and beautifully and bravely is, is the point. Right. So, and, uh, also, and I don't think they would appreciate being seen as tragic. Right, exactly. We, we also want to emphasize uh, with the book that, yes, they fought for the community politically, you know, socially, but they were also very, very talented people. And mm. we want to showcase their talent um, as well as their fight for the community. Ragingly defiant beauty, um, like I, I feel like the the defiance often led to creating new art forms in response to oppression. Um, uh, for example, in, in lip syncing, I was wondering yeah. if you could talk a little more about <laughs> sure. that. Yeah. One of the on, one of the themes that arose in the book is that queer art arises out of oppression. So there's a little bit of that when we talk about shade. Shade and reading were art forms that came through uh, the idea that black and trans uh, black drag queens and trans women because shade is an uh, African-American humor and social tradition. Um, it bubbled up because they needed to survive and, they, and it was such a brutal world living on the streets or whatever, as a lot of them did. Um, if you were a trans woman in the 1960s, chances are you were a sex worker. And if you were 
a drag queen in the 1960s, I would say probably 50% of them were sex workers because they couldn't, they couldn't get jobs doing anything else. Anyway, going to lip syncing. Uh, the lip syncing chapter was the hardest one to pull together. We knew we were doing a chapter on lip syncing because it's such a big deal in drag race, but we couldn't quite get the hook. Like, who are we gonna highlight and what's the story here? And um, eventually we found a thesis paper in our research online that had this wonderful story that explained how it arose. In the 1950s, uh, because prior to the 1950s, lip syncing wasn't a, it was occasionally a thing, but not a big thing. And it, it wasn't a very big thing in drag. Drag queens were performers, so they sang and they juggled or they told jokes, and mostly they sang and told jokes. Um, lip syncing wasn't much of a thing. What happened was the musicians' guilds in a lot of cities started char charging more and more exorbitant rates for gay venues or for venues that had drag queens in them partially out of um, just bigotry, and partially because if you were working in those places, you risked getting arrested. Those places were constantly raided. It was literally illegal. Um, so what happened was they started driving clubs, gay clubs and bars out of business, and the ones that survived were like, well, we can't keep booking musicians, so let's get these, quote, record queens, which is what they were known as at the time. And they were considered the lowest form of drag. Uh, drag queens would look down on them because a lot of drag queens, I mean, a lot of drag, most drag queens today would consider their work high art. But there were a lot of drag queens even back then who considered it very important what they were doing and considered all the work they did to learn how to do what they did. Um, that's what elevated them as performers, their talent and their work. They hated to see these queens get up there and just lip sync some record. Um, but over time, those queens who did it eventually did turn it into an art form, and it is now a very celebrated form right. of drag. Um, but uh, it, really tip, it really arose out of the idea that musicians didn't want to play gay clubs, and gay clubs had to figure out a way to entertain their people, so they put a record on and had a drag queen lip sync it. Right. Next thing you know, lip sync for your life, lip sync battle, all of that is, you know, it's, right. it's a thing now. And you have someone like Lip Sync, you know, bring it to a whole new level of Yeah, of Lip Sync is just this amazing queen yeah, who is, took... She is amazing. Again, if you Google her, uh, she, she's done everything. Broadway, she's been on TV shows everywhere. And her art is absolutely amazing. Yeah, her lip syncing is her incredible. Her lip syncing is absolutely incredible. Um, if you want to see the best lip syncing, lip syncer is the one. I can testify to that because it was one of the ones I looked up Did while I was the Anything <laughs> Goes video, the one where she sings Anything Goes? Yeah, black yeah, white. Black yeah. And white video <laughs> I watched that favorite. video. Like we a hundred did. times, a yeah. thousand times. <laughs> yeah. When I was, I was just like, let me just watch this and get inspired again because it's just three minutes of the best drop dead drag you've ever seen. It's old school. I mean, she looked uh, lip sync is classic look takes from the 1950s, so she had this very like, and she's singing like this cabaret version of Anything Goes, but it is just a stunning three minute video, and it's very easy to find. We absolutely love her. Like I have to tell anybody here how to Google. Yeah, <laughs> but she's fantastic, and yeah. we, we have a funny story because we really worship her, uh, and uh, we were all excited because we we're going to have her, you know, write about her. Put her on the cover of the book, and then she. No, we wrote a press release. And when we, we wrote a press the release. Book. Go ahead. Yeah, we wrote a press release when we announced the book, and we listed all the people that we were that was going to be uh, in the book, and she, one of the people we listed was her, and put the press release out, and maybe a day later we get this email from John Epperson, That's which his is name. Uh, Lip Sync is real name, and uh, all it said was. Um, Heard you bitches were writing a book. You might want to look up, uh, look up Wikipedia to see how you spell my name. But we spelled her name wrong in the in the press. Oh no! <laughs> and we're like, yes, she sent us an email. Yeah, and that was it. That was our only uh, interaction with Lip Sync. Well, we apologized. We were like, oh my god, we're oh so sorry. God, no, no, we no, promise no. it's spelled correctly in the manuscript. But, but we're uh, just excited to get an email. And we just love that we, we pissed off a drag queen the minute we announced the book. So I was like, that is so on point. Yeah, I love her response. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. It is. Um, so one of, the, one of the many things I learned reading the book is um, how often uh, drag or other queer performance was accepted and embraced uh, going all the way back to the 1920s yes, and, right. and the pansy craze, um, but only then to be met with, at times, violent backlash. Uh, so I have, this is kind of a, a two-part question, but uh, is there something about our current time that you think has enabled um, drag race to be so wildly popular. Um, and also, do you fear a backlash is inevitable? I'll start with the second part of right. the question is, yes, that is a fear. 
And uh, I remember being on Fire Island two summers ago with friends of ours, and it was all um, you know middle-aged gay men. And we were talking about we were talking about planning this book, and we were talking about this moment of this of of queer of kids just accepting queerness and and non-binary expression and drag race and all this. And a couple of the men that we were all sitting around talking were old enough to remember like the 70s. And they were like, yeah, I remember the 70s when Bowie was telling everyone he was bisexual and, and disco was everything. And then it all blew back. And then the 80s happened and we were rejected once again. And a lot of these older men were worried that this current moment was, that it was going to happen again. And uh, there's like, we highlight three different instances in the book where it did happen, which is the pansy craze of the 1920s, disco in the 70s was violently rejected in the disco sucks movement. And disco is, or originally was, a queer art form, queer black and Latinx art form. And then the 90s, uh, most people don't, until we contextualize it, people are like, the 90s? The 90s, Madonna's Vogue, uh, Wigstock, Paris is Burning, um, Tu Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Priscilla Queen of the Desert. Uh, there was a big gay draggy moment in the 90s that was partially a, a, respo um, a response to years of us being devastated by AIDS. Uh, there was this moment where we were like, fuck it all, let's just celebrate, put on some dresses and you know, dance and whatever. And then um, that got snapped back. Rue always talks about around 2000, she had no career at all. She was at the bottom low point of her career at the start of this century, and she said nobody was doing drag in the mainstream except straight men. And she met Wrench and Tyler Perry's Medea, or um, the Wayne's Brothers' White Chicks, or Martin Lawrence's Shanae Jenkins. And um, she felt drag had been at a really low point at that, and that's why, part of the reason why Drag Race was devised. She says it in the first uh, uh, season of the show. She said our, our goal is to bring back drag back to the mainstream, back at the top of the mainstream where it belongs. Um, again, I'm rambling. So what was the two-part <laughs> question? <laughs> well, the, the, the first part question is um, essentially, you know, Rue succeeded. Like it, right. She it, did? It, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah um, the thing is that with, with, with the success of the show is that it's awesome. Uh, you know, we still talk about when we first start watching Drag Race, it was like, the first show on television showing drag queens. I mean, before that, we would see drag queens at bars and clubs and so on, you know, never on TV, um, and not certainly not a whole show about them, right. where they were free to say whatever they want, talk about all things that, you know, queer people talk about. Um, so that was awesome, and the show kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but then it just got, it kind of lost what it was, you know, like it, it sort of like became big and then did, forgot that the show was about representing the, the queer community. If you watch the first seasons, um, you can see that uh, RuPaul actually uh, does a little introduction about certain things, references and things that they talk about or laugh about. Um, and then later on in the show, they still make the jokes. Uh, they still talk about things that belong to the community or they, they pull the directly from the queer, queer community. But that was it. And then the show became bigger, more people started watching it, all kinds of queer people start watching, and then at some point they realize, like, hey, you know, I don't see myself on this show. Uh, what's going on here? Um, and then they start questioning it. And RuPaul is very protective of the show, uh, and I and it just gave a bad response. <laughs> just didn't know how to deal with it. Uh, and I, I, we feel that they still have a lot to do uh, to represent everybody, to bring all the types of, of queer folks into the show. But I just want to say, I do, I, I fear that there will be another like sort of snapback of acceptance right. because it, it has played out so much. But I, I do have faith in uh, millennials and Gen Z. I, I honestly do. I, I do believe that it won't be. I, I, this, is, this moment right now doesn't feel like a trend. It feels like a sea change. It feels like the culture has shifted. It's not just, oh, we're all going to pansy shows in the 1920s and watching drag queens because it's fun and then going back to our lot, because that's what it was. We're all heading into New York to hit the discos and the gay clubs, and then we're all going to go back to New Jersey and, and live our lives. Uh, that's not what's happening right now. People's lives are changing. They're changing right. the way they talk about themselves. That you know. So there is a fear that the culture might not be as broadly accepting as it is right now, but I do have faith that the, the generations coming up behind us are gonna take this and run with it. As to why Drag Race became this 
phenomenon. Um, it happened concurrently with the rise of the uh, of transgender activist uh, advocacy. Uh, uh, gay men uh, and lesbians were pursuing adoption rights and marriage rights and military service rights, and those barriers started coming down for us. And when they started coming down for us, it was the trans people who stood and said, "Okay, it's our turn. You guys won. It's our turn." And they're right. Um, Happy you can get married now, but yeah, it's my turn now to get rights. And with that became a culture-wide questioning of the gender binary, which is what you're seeing in a lot, in a lot of young people right now. Um, this, this not, not a need to declare a gender, that sort of thing. And this goes back to your point about drag as the, being the perfect avatar of queer life, because it does encompass a lot. It encompasses right. gay male identity, it encompasses trans women, women's identities and its past, and it opens up the doors to non-binary. You know, if you're a 10 year old watching Drag Race for the first time, you're being told, in, you know, subtly, you don't have to be locked into anything, in, into any way of how you see yourself and how you present. If you're a little boy, you don't have to be what you're told. Here's an example of a bunch of former little boys who are not doing as they're told. So um, that, in combination with the current political and social rise of questioning the binary. That's why Drag Race. That, and as we said, RuPaul's, you know, Ru is a problematic figure. He's said some things, he's done some things that has pissed off the community. And I don't defend any of it. But you can't take away what Ru has achieved and how singular Ru is in our history. How many drag queens have done what Ru has done? None of them. Uh, it's happening, and I mean, now there are drag queens on, you know, it's broadening, and right. and there, at some day a drag queen's going to win an Oscar. Someday a drag queen's going to achieve high office or something. We just did an event last night in New York City with Marty Gould Cummings, who is a drag queen in New York, uh, and they're running for New York City Council. They're the first drag queen running for New York City Council, and that that's the most exciting part of what's coming next. So. Again, I rambled. I don't no, know if no. I gave you what you want. <laughs> no, you, you got it exactly. Okay. Um, uh, you, you mentioned how um, RuPaul's Drag Race had very humble beginnings on mm, kind right. of a, a little scene network. Um, and I want, I want to shift gears a tiny bit because um, I can't help but draw a parallel to kind of your, your own career and website <laughs> uh, because it, it also had somewhat <laughs> humble beginnings as a, a right. Project Runway uh, fan blog. Um, and now I know it's a site visited by millions for you know fashion and culture critique. Um, and, and the way that Drag Race has changed as um, queer culture has changed over the past 10 years, um, and you know, as you mentioned, needs to continue to change. Right. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like your own writing uh, and what you choose to cover on the site has changed as oh, well? Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. It started- Almost at, a 180 from right, 2006 right. when I mean, we started. I mean, we started the site uh, talking about Project One Way, the show Project One Way, that how we started, because we, first of all, at the time, um, not a lot of people were talking about uh, TV shows. You had TV recaps that they basically told you what happened the entire episode, but they weren't actually talking about uh, the show in, in the sense that, you know, making jokes and, and analyzing, cri analyzing, criticizing one thing or the other, or, you know, uh, congratulating one a person or a contestant or whatever. So that's what we started doing. Um, and as as some as fun, uh, I mean, I had to force him pretty much to start a blog because he was like, "No, we're busy. You know, we have to focus on our careers. This is just fun. This is not going to go anywhere, and we're just going to be wasting our time." I was like, "No, nope, we're doing it." Um, so we started, and it took off immediately because of the show. Also, Project One Way was, you know, the biggest huge show. at the time. Huge at the time. So the two things combined, <clears throat> and we kind of like knew that it was taking off. So. Um, but the difference between our writing in 2020 yes, well, and our, our writing in 20, 2006 right. is vast. That's we didn't I mean. know what yeah. we were doing. Right. And the, um, the online culture was like, well, blogging culture was very different. There is no blogging culture now. But back then, I always make this point, 2006, Gawker was ascendant. And every blogger who was hanging out their shingle right. was looking at Gawker to lead. The, and, and Gawker had a bitchy, snarky, especially back then, um, um, a kind of nasty side to it. And when you look at like uh, who arose back then, like Perez Hilton was the biggest fashion blogger, and I mean, gossip blogger in the world back then, made crazy money, um, and he was nasty. And when we, st I don't think we were ever nasty, but we were bitchy. 
Uh, and I don't mind being bitchy now, but I've learned how to be bitchy in a way right, that right. is funny and doesn't feel like we're hurting someone's feelings. And that, that, so the writing changed over time to not be so nasty. And I always say this, if we wrote now the way we wrote in 2006, we'd be out of business in a couple months. The second thing that we learned uh, by listening to our readers over the years was um, a diversity is to highlight a diversity in who we're covering. We were told we were covering thin white women too much, and we were told we were covering um, just the same two or three black women over and over and over again, uh, and we were told we weren't covering enough uh, women of size, plus size women. Listened to all of that, and then when we started writing more and more about the, these different, well, and I'm talking about fashion, like red carpet stuff. Then we were slowly trained on how to use the language and how to talk. I mean, if we're two white guys sitting talking about uh, a black woman on the red carpet, well, maybe don't go into what you think her hair should be because there's a long history right. of you know black women in hair, black children in hair, and the way white people react to it. Uh, you can't critique uh, where we're from where we're sitting. We can't critique a black woman's hairstyle the way we could critique, say, you know, Taylor Swift's hairstyle. And we had to be taught that. Um, we had to be taught how to how to be, how to write about uh, people outside our experience. And when oh, we always say this when Laverne Cox came along, when Orange Is the New Black came along, and Laverne came out, and we were thrilled at that point. We were like, oh my god, here is a black trans celebrity on the red carpet, high fashion all the way. We're getting a chance to write about this person. Uh, now we get. I mean, I think at least once a month we're writing about some trans celebrity now, but. That's the point, is that we learned over the years to be more uh, open in our thinking and more diverse in our coverage. And honestly, if we hadn't listened to our readers, we'd never have been able to write a book like this. Right. It made us better writers. On the 10th anniversary of our blog, we wrote this long piece covering all of these points. And then we said to our readers, so from the bottom of our hearts and in perfect sincerity, thank you for making us better people. Listening to all of those thousands right. of people who yelled at us for, for using the wrong language. Like, we used to toss around the word bitch. We used to toss it all the time. I haven't called a woman a bitch in my writing in 10 years because I, I, I realized you can't do that. We call ourselves bitches course, all, the yeah. all the time. And we call other dra gay men bitches all the time, but we have not used it as a gendered slur in no. almost 10 years because that's the stuff you learn, you yeah. know? Yeah, makes sense. All right, I, I know we only have a few minutes left, so I want to open up to our audience for Q&A. If you have a question, please go to one of the mics. Since Rue is singular, like, are there any other drag shows that you think uh, could come up in TV? I watched Dragula, I think, a season yes. or two, and it was interesting, but also kind of horrifying. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, like, what are your we thoughts on Dragula, you. and like, what would be, what what could you see as a show that like complements, supplements, or even replaces RuPaul's Drag Race? Okay, Dragula, I love it because uh, Drag Race. Um, has often been criticized rightly for narrowing the definition of drag to right. sort of this high glamour pageant drag. And something like Dragula comes along and says, oh no, drag can be freaky, drag can be disgusting, drag can be scary. And there are long traditions of right. freaky, scary, gross drag. Um, Divine rose out of that tradition. That's why Divine scared the crap out of everyone in the 70s. Um, but I don't see Dragula going mainstream for that reason alone. And actually, I think that's good. I think that we, it's, we should have sort of underground drag shows in, in our television viewing. What's going to probably be the next mainstream drag show is the types of shows they're trying to do now. There's one on TLC with like Thorgy, I can't remember who's in it. It's a makeover show. And then they're launching one on HBO the with Bob the Drag Queen. I can't remember who's in that one either. And they're all Drag Race alums. And again, they're they're going into these small towns and doing makeovers. Um, so that's probably the next mainstream drag show, drag television show will be something along those lines, using the art of drag to uh, to, to apply it to non drag queens, to make over women or to make over men and that sort of thing. Um, drag has this long tradition uh, or, of being perceived as this sort of transformative thing. If you look at movies about dra like Priscilla or Tu Wong Fu, it's about drag queens helping straight people out. It's a long tradition in how the mainstream sees drag. Um, so unfortunately, that's probably the next big drag. One of those shows or something like it will probably be the next big drag show we see. But. I'd really, we don't have, a, we don't live at a time where like variety television is, we, there's not a lot of opportunities for us to sit down and watch song and dance and sketch comedy. There's Saturday Night Live and there's RuPaul's Drag Race and there's a few others. 
But if someone could come along and some singular queen, like Bob the Drag Queen, someone who's really funny, really good, really talented, I'd love to see someone do a full-on old-school variety show of sketch comedy and acts and, and singing and, and with a drag queen host and maybe a drag queen cast. Um, as I, There's one thing Drag Race has shown, the mainstream, is that uh, drag can do a lot and it can be entertaining in a lot of different ways. Um, where drag is honestly making the most entree into the mainstream is in um, fashion and beauty. It has really, really influenced especially beauty right now. Um, um, who are the biggest makeup artists on YouTube are either drag or uh, um, non-binary or they're taking all, or trans or they're taking all of their cues from that makeup style. Uh, and you, oh, you also see it on the runways. The runways are, are showing much more draggy looks, more drag-inspired looks. Um, television, despite Rue's success in it, might not be the best venue for drag to hit the mainstream or to, in a big, big way. A whole show about A it. whole show, yeah, but, but... You will see them. You'll yeah. see a lot of copycat shows. Right. And, and you're seeing that now. So, I mean, Dragula is a bit like... It's a, it's a competition, right? Like Drag Race. Yes, so yeah. I'd love to see more of that, more shows like that 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 don't center such a um, pageanty style of drag. Um, what's her, uh, that show is coming out. It, they're doing a ballroom competition show. Um, uh, Jamila Jamil really stepped in it last month when she announced herself as a host and everybody came out and said, well, you're not queer and you're not a person, you're not black or Latinx and the whole new, whole turned into this drama, whole yeah. kerfuffle. But uh, ball community drag or ball community representation. You have Pose and now you have this show. I think you're going to see more and more of that. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. I'm struggling a little bit to turn this into a question, but I think what you said about reinterpretation of terminology and how people think about themselves in, in, in terms of the trans example that you gave is really, really important because mm -hmm. I, you see that happening all over in many, many contexts, especially with seem like the accelerating change in society and so on, that right. uh, it's, it's a good caution, it's a good, good thing to think about, right. about you know, do you interpret things in the context of that time, right. or do you interpret history in the context right. of today, right. which is fraught with peril. So I appreciate you bringing Thank you. point yeah. up in this. Well, to put, it, put that in context uh, um, a little bit, um, how gay people, how trans people, how uh, queer people have referred to themselves and defined themselves keeps changing. And again, there are men in my generation who hate the word queer, hate it, because it was a slur in their youth and, and it, they have a really hard time hearing it used that way. But if you look at the history of disenfranchised groups who come together socially or politically, they have all dealt with this. Since the civil rights era, we've cycled through about five or six acceptable terms for African Americans based on their, how they were identifying, how they were talking about themselves. Um, since the 1960s, we have come up with three or four or f even more different terms of what we call feminists. You know, they were women's libbers back in the day, that sort of thing, and then there was second wave, and then there was third wave, and this is common because when you're disenfranchised and you're coming together and you're, you're trying to reach goals or whatever, you are going to struggle with, well, how do we identify ourselves, ourselves instead of how the rest of the world is identifying us? And it's just this ongoing question in all disenfranchised groups about, or, or formerly disenfranchised groups, about how they are going to refer to themselves. Um, so, Again, I, thank you for telling me that, for saying that, because it was very um, important that we put that in there, that we put that context in there. There are people we're talking about in this book who, from our perspective, sorry, that's my mic, from our perspective were clearly trans, but nobody called themselves trans, so how do you do that? How do you talk about, I'm not going to impose a trans identity on someone who didn't identify that way. On the other hand, they didn't have the opportunity, like Gladys Bentley, the uh, the blues singer we keep referring to probably was transmasculine, probably was a, a transgender man. <clears throat> but we don't know and we can't declare that. We can't say that. Even Marsha and Sylvia, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, Marsha died before transgender was widely in use and uh, Sylvia died right around the time it became 
common, and she started referring to herself as a trans woman near the end of her life in the early part of the 21st century. But those women called themselves <laughs> transvestites. For a lot of t uh, their, uh, her life, Sylvia referred to herself as a gay man, but by our modern understanding, she was clearly a trans woman. Right. So in writing about that, we had to sort of step around it and make sure that we weren't imposing things on them. Hi. Um, so I, I love that um, you wrote the book with uh, people in mind that we could easily Google and it helps attract a wider audience. Would you ever write a book about more obscure figures? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> so many things. I would love to write a book about Gladys Bentley to be, to be, I know her name keeps coming up, but I love her so much. And I would love to write a book about hibiscus, although I think there have been a few written about him. So many times in our research online, we would come up to something and be like, please see the UCLA archives or the New York Public Library archives for more on this person. And they would have all their, UCLA has um, all of Charles Pierce's gowns. He had 10,000 gowns and they have them all in an archive. And I would have, I would have loved to have gone there, but ultimately we had to say no. Right. Um, the other thing, we keep telling every crowd we go to, if enough of you buy this book, I, we will do a legendary children of the world book because, we had to cut out like the history of French drag queens, the history of British drag queens, all the German drag queens who were rounded up and sent to the camps. So yes, I would love to do stuff that isn't instantly Googleable. So it's all based on how well this sells. <laughs> uh, but hopefully the next one, yeah. Uh, it was fun doing a, a basically a googly book, a book that was go where Google was built into the idea of the book. Um, but yeah, I'd love to follow it up with something more intensive. As to who, like I said, Gladys. Um, uh, hibiscus and honestly the number one is in this book the number one person that I would love to write their story is not queer at all it's a woman named Ruth Coker Burks who was in the, the chapter about um, queer families and she was she's still alive I mean she's only about 60 she's not that old she was a young woman in the 80s who um, happened to be visiting a friend in a hospital and found herself in a dying gay man's room because she heard the nurses making jokes about him and um, don't give it away. I won't give it away, but <laughs> she did uh, because if I do, I'll, I will start crying up and here. Let them read that part. <sighs> she, I don't mind saying no. <laughs> she spent 15 years um, nursing gay men and bringing them their meals, helping them write their obituaries, trying to contact their families, and when their families wouldn't come get them or help them, she buried them. <laughs> with her bare hands in her family cemetery in Arkansas. And she has 40 men, some of which she had them cremated and she would put them in like chipped cookie jars and bury them. And she partnered with a local Arkansas drag queen named Norma Christie who was the owner of the Miss Gay America pageant. And the two of them spent the 80s putting on drag shows and raising money and ushering these men to dignified deaths. And no one's written her story. And uh, if you look at a picture of her, you can Google her. In the 80s, she looked like Emma Stone. And the first time I saw the picture, I was like, oh my God, this is Emma Stone's next Oscar. I want to write this book. It's such <laughs> a great inspirational story. Um, so honestly, she's my number one and she's not even queer, but what an amazing woman. What an amazing, poignant thing that she did. So. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.